responsibility of uh, transgender people uh, has uh, become uh, quite prominent uh, in Australia and in other Western nations. And uh, it's, it's really uh, come to prominence in the debate over uh, safe schools, uh, same-sex marriage, and also uh, bathroom access. Now, I consider myself in the the middle of the transgender issue. Like, I don't share the, as it's called, you know, trans uh, panic that some conservatives uh, display, but I also, you know, don't, uh, I don't buy the, uh, as I call it, trans mania, which is, you know, every, like, trans person uh, is a hero and, you know, needs to be uh, celebrated. And I also don't, you know, uh, don't, don't buy that, you know, there's, uh, 76 non-binary uh, genders and that uh, uh, gender is fluid. I am, um, so as I, I call myself a uh, trans traditionalist because, you know, contrary to what the media tells us, trans people have actually been around for, you know, the, the past 50 years. It's only now that the left has really, you know, uh, championed, you know, what they see as uh, uh, transgender issues. I mean, as a uh, trans woman, like, how do you see the, um, you know, uh, transgender movement, which, how, how do you think it's, uh, which direction do you think it's going in? It's definitely the cultural Marxist uh, direction. And um, the term you used earlier, just then, I, I quite liked it. You described yourself as a trans, um, you described yourself as a trans traditionalist. I would also describe myself as a trans traditionalist. And from what I gathered from a quick overview, uh, overview of what that means as a trans tradition, a traditionalist as yourself, I think you're taking a very reasonable approach. I think anyone out there that's taking the trans traditionalist approach is being very reasonable. Of course, the left, the politically correct, uh, the political correctness brigade, the culture Marxists, um, they, they want us to engage in what you've described as transmania. And it's a concern for me as a trans woman, um, you know, um, back about, you go about um, up until a decade or two ago. So up until the early and 90, 2000s, it was, there was more of a focus on real issues that had real implications for trans people. So um, violence, um, real physical violence against trans people just because of who they are, uh, because of who they are. Um, uh, refusal to, um, uh, refusal of public health care providers to um, provide, uh, you know, quote unquote, adequate, uh, adequate care for trans people. Um, so a lot of that, um, those safety issues, um, you know, discrimination, you know, being able to just get on with your job in the workplace and not being harassed over being transgender. The trans narrative used to be concerned with those real issues that had um, real and a lot of times tragic uh, consequences, if not um, managed in the best way possible. Of course, with the trans narrative, thanks to cultural Marxists, because now they're writing it, it's degenerated to, um, as you you just mentioned, gender flu uh, fluidity. Um, in my view, um, if you, and you can do a Google search for this, in my view, um, there is a, a science, a biological science, a medical science to being gay, to being lesbian, to being bisexual, uh, to being intersex. There is a medical science to being transgender, or my preferred term is transsexual. Although the medical science behind that, at this stage, it's um, somewhat inconclusive, it's a bit shaky, um, but nevertheless, it's out there. But tr try to Google for, try to look up, try to do research on a medical science behind something other than LGBTI. So I suppose the stuff for um, the letters that come after TI. Um, so you've touched on gen fluidity. There is no medical science. Um, there are only, you look at history and you look at the medical science, you look at the history of other civilizations and cultures, um, more or less it's, there's only two, ever been two genders and there'll continue to be 
only two genders. These supposed other types of genders, they're more or less variations of um, genders, of um, gender express, uh, expressions. So different types of femininity, masculinity, um, you know, this is where you would use the term androgynous. So there's a spectrum, in my view, of gender expressions. So, you know, um, some, a, 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 a space, a quite varied space of gender expression. So um, some women like to only wear pants. Some men like to dress a bit more femininely. And um, there's all sorts of variations of gender expressions. You know, you go back to the Victorian era. In the Victorian era, pink was a boy's colour. And of course, that changed culturally over times. Um, but that's something that society was happy with. So, so yeah, um, LGBTI um, used to be about um, issues that had safety implications and uh, other um, types of implications that, if not dealt with in the best way possible, could have real life um, quite and you know quite tragic consequences. Now we're heading towards a narrative that's about issues that don't have that gravity like they used to, like the other, like the issues that I just mentioned. Um, you know, if it's, it's, the consequences aren't as severe as can you hold down a job and just get on with the job and not be harassed? Um, can you um, pay for your, your own medical care and pay for it and be able to have access to it? Um, so, you know, it's, it's still a problem in some sense. It's not a big problem like it used to be. So now the culture Marxists have to find other issues to fight on that don't have as, um, as, you know, that gravity, doesn't have that gravity of seriousness. Now it's all, it, it trivializes, in a way it trivializes what used to be real issues that had, um, Tra potentially tragic consequences if not dealt with appropriately. I think the left were initially uh, threatened by um, uh, trans people because it disproved their belief that gender was a social construct, and that's why you had, uh, as uh, as they're called, you know, trans exclusionary radical uh, feminists who opposed uh, trans people because it you know, wrecked their narrative. And so now, obviously, they're, they're, you know, they don't want to be seen as being mean to, you know, trans people, and that's why they've tried to, you know, merge, um, you know, trans issues with this uh, non-binary uh, gender uh, fluidity stuff, which I think is, uh, uh, you know, being, you know, trans it's, it's the the reason that you you know tran transition from one gender to the other is because you know you want to take on what are the you know uh traditional you know roles of the the opposite gender yes yeah, so i i mean i would describe myself as someone that jumped from one side of the heteronormative binary that's as very specific term, um, and hetero. So heteronormative binary means um, uh, it means that you're one sex or the other, um, you're one gender or the other. Um, you lean towards one set of gender expressions than the other, um, and um, you're effectively straight. So I jumped from one side of the binary, heteronormative binary, to the other. Um, and, you know, sexual, from a sexuality point of view, um, we know that there's different types of sexualities and sexual orientations, and I'm not too concerned because usually that involves uh, consenting responsible adults over the age of 18, and... Um, uh, I, I'm not too, con you know, I'm not too concerned about it as long as, you know, there's consent and, you know, it's not being uh, forced down people's throats, then I'm pretty, I'm pretty cool with um, a, a bit different types of um, sexual orientations out there. Um, and I, I'm a straight woman, yes, and I, I think that's neither here or there. So from a sexual, putting aside um, the recent same-sex marriage survey, which went way beyond being about sexuality. It, 
and we discussed this earlier. Um, of course, what's the trendy thing to talk about now? Um, you know, for a while in recent times, it was about transgender people who, um, you know, we generally, it used to be transgender, transgender people for the most part had diagnosed real gender dysphoria, so to speak. And I use the word real in the sense of what we're now seeing in the medical profession, in the healthcare profession, is there's now two types of gender dysphoria. There is the traditional, so this is um, from a trans traditionalist point of view, the traditional early onset gender dysphoria. And I don't need to harp on about um, what the signs and symptoms of uh, what they are. We know what they are. You know, for me, growing up when I was four years old, I knew there was something different about me and I, I could go on, but that's a quite common narrative. And now what we're seeing is what uh, what is being called rapid onset gender dysphoria. There is no medical science behind it um, at this point in time. And in my view, it's not real because you rapid onset gender dysphoria basically means you didn't grow up as a young child feeling that you were different, identifying strongly with the opposite sex. Um, we see cases of rapid onset gender dysphoria where there are other um, social, there are other psychological issues happening in the background. And because we've normalised transgenderism, we've normalised transgenderism, we've demedicalised um, transgenderism, I'm concerned about the demedicalization of transgenderism. You know, um, there's currently a push. We went from gender identity disorder in the Australian, I think it's called the Australian Psychological Association's uh, DSM, so Diagnostic and Statistical, Statistical Manual. Um, version 4 used to call it, I think it's version 4, used to call it gender identity disorder. Then because it was somewhat offensive, version five is now calling, the current version is now calling it gender dysphoria, which I don't have too much of a problem with, but there's, um, there's now a much bigger push to get gender dysphoria um, out of the, uh, the psychological, psychiatric um, Bible, so to speak. Um, so, you know, it's normalising transgenderism and, um, in my view, rapid onset, um, rapid onset gender dysphoria, in a way, is a consequence of how we've normalised and we've demedicalised being transgender, and it trivialises what I went through growing up. Um, what I'm, you know, I still feel pain and grief as a trans woman because of my previous experiences, and that you know, transgenderism and being transgender is something I have to carry with me. For the rest of my life and now it's been trivialized thanks to the cultural marxists uh, also uh, a lot of opposition to the i will call it the the modern um transgender movement comes from uh conservatives and a lot of a lot of their the argument hinges on that you know it's not it's you know you can't simply um you know change your you know actual biological uh, sex it involves taking you know uh, bo uh, body altering uh, hormones which in the case of male to female makes you um, you know in infertile and they're especially concerned uh, about uh, children uh, transitioning because um, a lot of people don't consider children to be capable of making such life altering uh, decisions uh, uh, what's your response to the, the concerns that conservative have about um, uh, tra uh, transgender uh, and trans transitioning. So I happen these uh, these days I happen to agree with a lot of um, what conservatives have to say. In my view, the conservative views that are floating out there on trans issues they're not transphobic. I mean, they might used to be, they, they might used to have a transphobic angle, but these days. It's not transphobic. I strongly believe that I've talked to um, social conservatives myself. It's they're not into the business of transphobia. Maybe some of them, but for the most part, they're not in this day and age. 
And it's not even, I mean, maybe part of the reason is that they they feel that they need to walk on eggshells um, as a way to at least um, maintains, uh, uh, maintain a level of validity, validity of the concerns they're raising, but I still don't think it's transphobic. I mean, let's look at the conservative argument that, um, you know, you can't, um, trans people don't end up, when they transition, they don't end up changing sex. Well, it's a biological fact that you can't change um, chromosomes. I can't, I, you know, I'm more than happy to admit that I'm a woman, I'm a trans woman, or I'm a woman that has XY chromosomes. I have no qualms about admitting that because that's the biological truth. I'm not, I'm not going to run away from the truth. Um, um, so they're 100% right on that. You can't change biological sex. In my case, I chose um, for my own sanity and for my own um, mental health to um, transition from one gender to the other, but biologically, I'm still male. Um, in my view, that doesn't make me less of a woman, but I'm not going to deny biological reality. Um, and now can the concerns about, you know, how young is young Conservatives aren't too concerned these days about adults deciding to trans transition, you know. Okay, they may not necessarily agree with um, trans people deciding to transition as adults, but it comes back to the whole live and live, let live as long as you're not hurting anyone. So their conser social conservatives are taking that on board, um, which is pleasing to see. And I'm not concerned at all for their concerns about you know, how young is too young for trans children? Um, they've got some valid concerns. Um, there is no, the medical science, the research behind the current healthcare approach towards treating trans children, the direction it's he heading, the research that we have available out there, it's shaky. And I don't blame conservatives. I mean, I'm a conservative. This is why I'm a conservative now. I don't blame conservatives for being concerned because, as you know, as this is ticking along, and you know, we're still not sure of the long-term ramifications of, you know, treating um, these, you know, what is an explosion of trans children cases in the healthcare world. Um, whilst that's been happening. The cultural Marxists, the left, the politically correctness, political correctness brigade, they've been normalising transgenderism. So, is the normalisation of transgender, the normal, the normalisation of transgenderism, is that encouraging a culture, a, a new culture in Western society where, you know, gender dysphoria isn't treated medically and as seriously as it used to be. And there's anecdotal evidence to suggest that, um, you know, long gone the days that you walk into a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a psychiatrist's office, an endocrinologist's office, um, long gone the days where they would be the strong gatekeepers that make, you know, they do their jobs properly and make sure that um, you do indeed have um, early onset, in my view, real gender dysphoria there's anecdotal evidence these days that, you know, it could just be a 30 minute appointment with um, the psychiatrist and then a 30 minute appointment with the endocrinologist. Yep, you it, it, more or less, if you say that you've got uh, got gender dysphoria, um, you know, after a bit of um, diagnostic testing verbally, um, yeah, that's it. You can start hormone replacement therapy. Um, and this isn't, you can Google this, there's anecdotal evidence for this, and it is a concern. So, and, and there are cases, there aren't too many, but there are cases of adults who decide, who think that gender transition is for them, they transition and they realise, oops, that's not for me. If there are adults, there aren't a, there aren't a big number of them, very small number, if there are adults that can make that mistake, then... I don't accept the excuse that, oh, you know, the uh, by that, you know, sure, we'll have some trans children um, who transition much, you know, way too early, I mean, and I'm regretting it. Oh, you know, I, I get the vibe that it's a small, 
a small price to pay approach that I'm hearing from um, the left, the cultural Marxists. You know, one life ruined is too many lives in my view. So if we're, in my view, if we're going to treat transgender children medically for um, their gender dysphoria, um, I like to think that those children have, you know, real gender dysphoria where they show very extreme signs and symptoms that, you know, they need to be treated otherwise. You know, there's, there are some stories of trans children doing extreme things such as getting mum's nail clippers and, you know, trying to cut off their penis. Um, you can Google that as well. You know, that's pretty extreme and that needs to be looked at medically and treated very seriously. But it just seems like the approach um, for some parents and for some medical pre professionals these days is, oh, you know, it's, it's almost like it's treated like it's a trend, it's a fad. Well, I'm sorry, that trivialises the pain of the pain and grief that I went through early in life, the pain and grief that I, I'm still going through, the pain of grief that people who've experienced very extreme, very um, hurtful, you know, internally hurtful gender dysphoria. Um, this isn't trivial, but apparently it is these days. This has been an unshackled fast. Please like, comment, and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.